We're going to start now. So welcome to the Swedish NLP seminar. Uh, my name is Magnus Solgen. I will be the moderator here today. Uh, so this is a bi-weekly seminar series that we organize here from AI Sweden together with RISE. Um, and we uh, have, uh, for those of you who join us online, we have a physical seminar site here at the AI Sweden office in Stockholm. Sometimes we also have a physical site in Gothenburg. Uh, not today, but uh, I think next seminar in four weeks time, we will also have the Gothenburg uh, office. So if you join us online and you happen to be in Stockholm or Gothenburg, feel free to, to join us at the uh, seminar sites. Uh, we also have the option to uh, sign up for co-working on the seminar days. And I know that some of you who are here have done that. That means that you can spend the office, uh, the day here at the S Stockholm office, not in Gothenburg and just hang out and meet other people in the NLP area. Um, so we try to select topics that, are, that we think are relevant for sort of the broader NLP community in Sweden. But of course we have a slight bias for things that we think uh, is interesting in the NLU research group here at AS Sweden. And today we're going to focus on uh, applications of language technology in the legal domain. And this is something that is of particular interest for us at the moment, because we are thinking about um, how you apply large language models in different domains. The legal domain seems to be an interesting domain for us. So we are considering starting initiatives in this direction, uh, particularly with a model that we have developed, gpt Sui, which I'm thinking you all know about. There might be a link to the model in the chat uh, soon. And um, so we're really excited to learn more about this domain uh, today with uh, three great presentations. So we have Shell Kukunlu will be first out from Nordstedt Juridik. Uh, then we have Jon Lagström who will join us online from Domstolsverket. And then we have Magnus Sundqvist from Maigon uh, to present. Then uh, Shell Kuk, uh, please. I'll leave everything to you. Thank you. Thanks, Magnus. Um, let me try sharing my screen here. First of all, thanks, Magnus, for, for having this topic. Uh, super interesting, and I love being here, um, mainly due to the topic being very interesting from our point of view. What I'm going to talk about a little bit is how a traditional legal publishing house transitions to the new area and leverage NLP to uh, enhance its legacy. So where I come from is it a very traditional uh, publishing house that has been around for, well, 200 years uh, this year. Uh, so we're one of the oldest companies in, in Sweden, actually. Um, oh, I've put a hopefully there, because I'm hoping that we're going to do that. Uh, I can't promise it. I will be talking more general, while my other friends will be showing a couple of demos, but I don't have a demo yet. Manus, I hope I can come back later this year, because then I'll have a demo. <laughs> Uh, a disclaimer on, on me so that you know my background and how that has affected what I'm going to say here uh, and, and what mistakes I might, I might have. Uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, and, and that means that I'll have challenges with numbers. Uh, numbers are mainly used for counting money. That's what we lawyers do. I have some challenges with tech, and, and I've never needed to reboot a pen on paper. So that, that's, that's where we start. And I'll be a little bit of a change aversive. Uh, and, and that is a little bit why change a, a format that works pretty well and we can build a lot of money and my tail is getting old. Um, and these are a little bit of stereotypes when it comes to lawyers. I know a couple of my colleagues are very much looking to change this, this narrative. Why NLP and law is very interesting. I'm going to go back to my first year at law school. Uh, my first day, my law professor said this. The carpenter might have her hammer, but the lawyer has his or her language. So, so the language is, is what we consider a hammer. That, that is the, the core part of the, the legal method. It is uh, a very structured um, uh, setup, and it goes through all the millions of documents that you can find, uh, either if it's written by a court, uh, a, a lawyer, it will be using the same similar language and the same wordings in it. 
Uh, and that's why I think that NLP and law is really a match made in heaven. And I think Magnus might agree on that one. Thanks. Nurtis <laughs> Yudik, uh, that's the company I come from. Um, work as a business developer there. Um, the 200 euro publishing house turning into a legal research company-ish. It, it's been a, a rough journey. A lot of uh, uh, questions about who are we? What kind of identity do we have? We are the publisher of the Sveriges Rikes Law, the law book. We've been doing that for, for, for centuries. Or are we transitioning to something like a, a Google for lawyers? So it's a, it's a um, uh, tug and pull within the company of, of who we are. Uh, but with that said, we do have a, a legal research tool, a database with uh, well over 3 million documents. And, and that one is increasing with at least 1,000 documents on a, on a daily basis. So it's a lot of data in, in, in that. The data is, is, a lot of it is public data. It's laws, it's the case law. It's a lot of annotated data. So for every uh, paragraph in the law, we have a couple of different commenters, how that should be interpreted. Uh, there's a lot of author data. There's summaries, there's enhanced data, but there's also a lot of haystack, needle in the haystack kind of data that we don't really know what to do with. Um, so the question will be, how do, how do we leverage publishing house legacy and, and data for NLP success? So for that, we have looked a little bit of an NLP agenda for ourselves. What is it that we think uh, is, is doable in the short time, in the long term, and um, what would actually generate value for um, our customers, customer base, which is mainly uh, lawyers, uh, judges, uh, and, and, and et cetera. Started by, by building up our own little data science team. Uh, we're looking into doing a legal translation uh, solution. Um, that's mainly due to that we have some data that is already manually translated, and we see a, a pretty interesting globalization in an area that's usually very restricted, restricted to its borders. We are looking at experimenting with a chatbot. And, and this one comes all the way from the board saying that you have to do this after they played around with chat GPT. Uh, that's, that's what happens. But that, that thing has actually made, made my work a little bit easier. Uh, I'm going to stay on these two a little bit more. It's summaries and it's uh, case law dash, dashboard that is a little bit closer. Those are the ones that I might want to show later this year. On the summaries, um, Legal documents are usually very, very long. You can change from maybe a five pages to four, 500 different pages. So today, internally, we have uh, a team of five, six lawyers that goes through the court decisions that comes in on a daily basis and actually manually write summaries on them just to make, make it um, possible to digest that big chunk of data that comes in to our lawyers on a, on a daily basis. Um, so what, we, what we're looking is, well, what ambition we have, can I move this one, sorry, mm. is to see if we can have a full case law summary. So at the same time as it comes in, use our current database of around 45,000 uh, case law summaries that is manually done the last uh, 10 plus years, or 20 plus years, I think, and see if we can use that data to actually automate this process in, in some sense. That would be the first step of it on case law. The second, what we've done to experiment a little bit more is can we do this on preparatory work? And, and the reason why preparatory work might be harder is that those range from two to 500 pages each. Um, and another possible use case for this one is, would be um, other uh, legal text heavy documents. It could be police report, police investigation report, which today, takes a lot of time for the uh, courts and the lawyers to go through. Um, case law dashboard. I'm gonna go a little bit on the background on, on this one. Um, for those who are not lawyers, uh, from the case law perspective, it's basically just the Supreme Courts that, that, that in Sweden can, can uh, have any kind of prejudicial value into it. Uh, any lower, lower level courts will not have it. Uh, there's one exception, there's a couple of exceptions for that, and that is the number three there, 
if we can see a trend or a pattern within low level court, then that would have directional value to it. So, so a couple of months ago, I did a check to see, okay, but do we see the court referencing low level courts or district courts in, in, in any significant, significant level? And what, what we can see is that uh, that has actually increased quite a lot. It's from the last eight years, we see that references from low level courts uh, to district courts has increased with 274%, which is a huge number and kind of uh, implies the value of district level courts in a whole uh, different setting. Um, with that in mind, we definitely started looking at, okay, but can we um, do something with that? Can we take uh, district level court, aggregate and visualize that one to start looking at the patterns, the trends that, that are there? Because uh, if you argue for a case in, in court, um, it would bear a lot of weight if you can show that the five uh, last courts within this case uh, found this verdict and have a sixth court go against that would be a really, really hard thing to do. Um, the thing that we think would be possible here, and um, we have our partner in, in 1050 that we, that we spar with in, in these questions, we think that we can do it when it comes to uh, domain specific questions. Uh, so, so, so very specific questions. What we want to experiment with is can we do it more on a general level? Where you can afterward set up the, the parameters on, on that one. Um, what might make it easier would be a GPT Sweden 3 law. I'm looking at Magnus here. That's something you might do together. Um, before I end, I'm going to try to answer the question that I had in the beginning. Of how, how do we do this? And, and, and what I kind of found out while doing this presentation before, uh, it, probably not by hoping, uh, but, but by starting to, to, to play around with it, having a little sandbox and seeing where, where we can end up. So with that, I'm going to end it and leave it over to Jon. That will actually show some fun stuff. Yeah. And we don't have any questions in the chat now, so we're going to just go to John. And I don't really know how I'm going to click there, maybe. Yeah, then just leave it to John. Please go ahead. All right. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. I was actually not aware we were doing this in English. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm going to show you some stuff we've done with NLP, but it's all going to be pretty much in Swedish. I'm still going to talk in English, of course, but uh, I'm going to try and translate as we go. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks, Ibe, for a uh, uh, nice presentation. Uh, it's exciting to see what one of our partners, uh, Norsa Shirdi, is doing. Um, well, uh, about me, uh, I work as an innovation leader for the Swedish National Courts Administration. Uh, we have an innovation portfolio that encompasses uh, all of the Swedish courts. Um, I am a lawyer also, the same as Ibe, but I'm a business lawyer, so I know numbers. <laughs> um, I've worked with AI for a couple of years in, in our work with the innovation portfolio. Um, I've also worked in one of the um, EU Commission's expert groups on AI and new technology. Um, currently working in a EU Commission project called Aligner, where we uh, investigate and try and figure out how we're going to use AI today in law enforcement agencies and uh, uh, also, how we're going to use it tomorrow, pretty much. And uh, Ibe and I have a lot of common. Uh, I think we both like each other, but uh, we've also realized that innovation is about doing stuff, not sitting around talking about it. So uh, what we've done in the Swedish uh, National Course Administration is we've, we've built uh, and experimented with AI and a couple of different applications. Some are in production, and uh, this is my second presentation for AI Sweden. 
within the last two weeks. So I thought I'd mix it up a bit. And especially since Ibe is here, I'm going to show him, show you guys something that, um, that we've done with actually with their material. Um, we are not using GPT or any transformer models for these applications, but we are anxious to try it out. Uh, of course, just like everyone else, I guess. So um, the first uh, application I'm going to show you is actually uh, really closely connected to what Ibe and Gnosis Juridic is doing. Um, it's uh, basically a, a legal database uh, that we uh, used um, AI to search and um, present information in a different format than the commercially available legal databases have today. And uh, I'm guessing some of you are lawyers or at least come into contact and um, working with um, a legal database is like at the heart of um, the legal profession, actually. Um, I don't know any, any lawyers at all that do not work with um, a legal database. So it's a really important tool. And um, from our point of view, we also uh, are obliged to um, publish open data about our, uh, our decisions. And that's um, something that's going to increase a lot more. So we have a, a legal database for um, um, prejudice um, from the highest courts today called Vägledande uh, Avgörande. And we are currently developing it further. And um, what we've done could possibly be an extension of that, or we don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm still going to show it to you today. So as you see here, we have like a, you know, your standard, you can search for type in stuff and search for, for stuff here. Um, so for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to search for the word knife uh, in Swedish. So we're searching for a keyword and in all possible types of um, court cases. So we're punching this in and uh, straight from the start, you can see that we can, uh, by using the, the Royal Library's BERT model, we can use, use it to extract entities and some statistics from uh, the different documents. So we're having like uh, 300 matching documents, which is kind of broad, you know, and we just search for knife. We can see statistics if someone was sentenced to jail, in that case, how long, uh, if they had uh, community service, in that case, how many hours. Uh, and this, this is all useful information for a practicing lawyer, uh, especially if you're working in the court uh, to see if there were any fines and so on. Uh, and we have a bunch of cases that shows up here. So we can just dive into one here. Uh, which is a case um, regarding the uh, crime of carrying a knife in a, in a public place. So let's dive into that. So as you can see here, there's a, there's a um, fair amount of, wait a minute, I'm just going to scroll up, of anonymization in this. And that's something that we're working on also. Uh, within NLP. I'm going to show that uh, a bit later. And uh, this is uh, the whole uh, sentence. And as you can see here, we have some highlighted uh, expressions. So one here is Rettegångsbalken, which of course, that's not the name of that law, uh, but we're using the BERT model. So it it, could, it has a, a fair bit of semantic understanding. So you can click on this and you're gonna get um, the actual um, name of the law, which is Rettegångsbalk, of course. You can also do this, uh, it, so, so it understands if you were to write the, the knife law or something, uh, it, it would uh, know that it would be this long name of 
uh, of the uh, ban against knives and other dangerous objects. No. So we can pull that up pretty much straight away if there's a uh, specific uh, paragraph that it's referenced here. Uh, and, and that's uh, that's pretty handy. And, and so far, it's pretty much uh, what you can expect from a commercially legal database. Um, and uh, but what's nice here is we can also, also extract metadata using uh, NLP. So what was the verdict? Uh, he was sentenced for what crime? Uh, how many uh, fines were it? What was the total fine? Um, how many months in jail uh, was he sentenced to? Uh, did he get parole uh, or probation? Uh, are there any uh, um, court cases from the highest instances that are referenced here? Uh, and so forth. So that's also used. This is all unstructured uh, material here. And, and we're using the BERT model to, to make it structured. But we also have this column, which is similar cases. Uh, and that's interesting because what makes a case similar or not uh, is it, it, pretty, pretty interesting. And, uh, and we can use, do that using NLP, which makes uh, our searchers or our searches a lot more uh, precise. We don't have to uh, get 300 hits on a search. We could get a lot less and a lot more specific. So we're going to do that now. Uh, and um, we're going to see if we can dig up some sort of context here uh, in the text. Uh, maybe uh, we can see if there is uh, intent to carry the knife. Um, so, yeah, here we go. So he's saying that his purpose with having the knife was to show it to his mom. Okay, uh, that's weird. But he also uh, felt that he was so threatened, so he had... Um, I don't know what a knogian is in, in English, but, but this is something that speaks. He, he, he's feeling threatened. So um, we're going to take this and, and we can take like huge chunks of, uh, of text here. We could take a whole case actually, uh, or if it's a really complicated case with a lot of um, a lot of different contexts or a lot of different uh, crimes or anything. Um, and we can go back to our original search field. And instead of just searching for one keyword, we can paste the whole thing in. And instead of searching for a keyword, we could do a neural search. And this is where AI really comes in here. Um, so now we're searching. Let's see what happens. All right. So here we go. So now we got, you know, of course, that's our case, the one we had. But this one is interesting. And if you remember, uh, I think this we what, what we copied was if there was someone that felt like threatened or something so somewhere here uh, we should find that oh yeah uh, oh i lost it they say he carried it in self-defense uh so that's kind of that's the similarity between these two cases. Uh, and you can dive into a lot more. There are others, of course, um, further down. And they're st still going to be uh, containing the whole threat um, aspect of it, because that's what we wanted to search for. So, and, and this is really powerful when you're a practicing lawyer, because you could search for uh, it opens up possibilities to search for uh, 
completely different contexts and uh, complexities uh, in the vast material uh, that you have in a legal database. Just as like Iba said, they have more than three and a half million documents in there. And how do you know that what you're finding is the one that truly uh, gives you the most amount of information? You don't. So, yeah, uh, that was half my time. <laughs> um, what I'm going to show you is also um, an application that we are currently uh, developing right now. Uh, it's not um, completely uh, production ready yet, but it's bound to create a lot of um, efficiency in, in the courts. Um, um, well, in the courts. So uh, I should just do this. It's the, yeah. Yeah. So uh, in Sweden, we have the principle of public documents, which means that anybody can go to a government agency and request to see a certain document. Uh, it's a key pillar of a democratic society, or at least of our democratic society. And as such, um, you have the right to know if there's a document that has either been created or it has been uh, sent away from the government agency or a received by government, government agency. It doesn't, however, mean that you get to see all the information in that particular document, because there's uh, legislation that says that if someone is, something is, um, uh, maybe violating violating your integrity or it's a sensitive uh, sensitive information on a certain person uh, that information should be masked and this is something um, requests for public documents happens all the time in Swedish courts uh, multiple times a day and documents can sometimes be from anything from two to uh, three and a half thousand pages, you know. Um, we had like case in um, in Stockholm not long ago regarding human rights and the uh, the material, just the written material were 80,000 pages. And of course, all the journalists want to have it, you know. So you got to go through 80,000 pages. Uh, and that takes a lot of time and, you know, People can make mistakes. So uh, what we're trying to do is create an application that can do the masking part for us using uh, the same model that I used before, actually, the BERT model uh, and some other stuff. But we're not going to go into specific now. Yes. So we have a case here I'm going to show you. Uh, and we're going to try that case uh, in our masking application. And as you see, it's called res judicata because that's what it's about. So we're going to go in here uh, and we're going to find that case and we're going to upload it to our application, hopefully. All right, sorry. And just actually did this uh, in, in front of like a hundred people once and it didn't work. So <laughs> hopefully it does now. Uh, either way, we uploaded it and here we want to see, or we got to choose which entities that are not going to be masked. So we're not going to want it to mask all like locations or company names or events or times, uh, objects, works or numbers. Maybe we want to just like have names, personal numbers, maybe some other stuff. Um, and we can also choose if there are words that we maybe we don't want to uh, mask all names. So we can just go in, maybe say, oh, it's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to. 
give me just a second. Uh, and I'm running this, I should say that it, it, it runs best when you have hardware with GPUs use. And I'm running a standard laptop with CPUs. So that's why it sometimes doesn't work. And why I got to go down to support and ask for a new computer. Um, and yeah. So I think you're seeing my screen now, right? I'm going to go up just in a second. Right, here we go. Oh, even two. So we're still going to try our case here. Yeah, and now I can see. Because I got a prompter down here, so I can see if it works or it doesn't. So. Now it does. So what it does now is it scans the, uh, the whole document pretty much and it detects uh, entities um, using the BERT model. And it, normally this would be done by a court clerk or a, even a judge. They would have to sit and read through the whole document and manually mask out uh, the information that in this case, personal uh, information. And we did it in, in pretty much no time. So I just had to restart the application, of course. But <laughs> uh, hopefully that won't be an issue for um, the production ready model. But it is what it is. So we can choose which words shouldn't be uh, masked out here. So. Maybe this is like the court's um, court members' names, and we don't want to have that be masked out. And we're just doing it. We can use also if, if we want to use an alias for some people, we can use that, but we're not going to do it now. And now we're running the whole masking part. And if you have a long document, this could take up to uh, a week for someone to sit through this. If you have a file with 3,500 pages, uh, it takes a lot of a lot of time to go through it, and uh, uh, you got to stay focused doing it. So it's pretty tedious, and we've done it in in this amount of time. So as you see, all the personal in, ident personally identifiable information that we wanted to mask is masked. So this is this should save a lot of time and energy in the courts and probably uh, help um, a lot of, uh, you know, human errors and stuff. So I think I reached my limit for 20 minutes, right? Um, so I should probably leave it over to you, Magnus. Thanks, John. Uh, really cool presentation. Uh, and we're going to take questions afterwards. So we're going to hand over to Magnus now from uh, Maigon. So directly to you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. So my name is Magnus, as everyone else here. And uh, <laughs> I'm from Maigon, and we are a Swedish company. We originate from a law firm. So we started in a law firm three years ago from Sync Law Firm here in Stockholm. So we started to, or I should say this also, I'm not a lawyer <laughs> compared to others. And if you are attend, if you're thinking about working against the legal industry, you should know that they, in that industry, you are a lawyer or you are not a lawyer. That's the only things you can <laughs> separate people around. So you're not female or anything like that. It's just lawyer, non-lawyer. Uh, but when you work with them, it could be fun in a way. Uh, but we are, what we have, <laughs> I have a lot. Uh, what we are doing, we are a little bit different from the others that you have seen here before, because we are just working with uh, business law, and we are what we are doing is aiming more or less straight to uh, large enterprises and the legal departments. So what we are trying to do is to help them to work more efficient, and I think that's also it's not necessary always necessary that we are doing everything one hundred percent right. It could be eighty percent right because that's better than 
that they are not reviewing document at all, or I mean, they spend enough time. It's a, it's a risk, more of a risk of evaluation, how much they want to spend on this. Uh, and what we are doing is, uh, I don't know, I should start with this also, that uh, I have been, myself, I've been working at EY for 15 years and then seven years in law firms. And during this time, all of this 20 years, they have been talking about AI and now the products is coming and you should be fair, you will lose your job and everything will happen. And all of the conferences I've been at the last years, this has been like that. And the only products that has been launched the last five years is around due diligence, tools that help you when you buy a company and you have to review tens of thousands of documents and see if this is the right, right legislation, if they are assigned or not and things like that. And all the big law firms in Sweden, now this five years ago, they say, ah, now we have started to use Kira and Luminance. That's the due diligence tools. But none of them did. They just bought them and said they have them. But they, they were useless because they couldn't. They, first of all, they were not able to read uh, using Swedish documents. They just, uh, it was just English. But also you had to do a lot of uh, adjustments to them yourself to make it work. So they used them as project management uh, tools, but not the AI part of it. But yeah, if anyone gets offended now, it yeah, shouldn't be any problem. <laughs> but so what we have done is that when we started with this is that we try to solve another problem, the daily work. What are you, what, what, when you get the document, you get NDA. I will, sorry, I'm a little bit excited. <laughs> I have been, this is my second presentation today. So I'm a little bit, hmm. uh, but what we try to do is to help you take away like 90% of the review time you spend on reviewing documents. And in-house legal departments, they are getting a lot of standard documents. They are reading NDAs, DPAs, or uh, Sekretessavtal, and other of these standardized documents that it's not that fun to read, but there are a lot of them and they are necessary to, to review. And what we try to do is not to replace you as a human being or a lawyer, if they are, uh, but instead, we should help you just to focus on the right things, take away a lot of the standardized work you do. Uh, and we say with what we have done that we can save like 90% of your time, but we will not replace you because you still have to take care of the errors we find or the issues we find. That's up to you to take care of. Uh, and the reason why we are doing this against not law firms, because in law firms, they are experts in finding <laughs> mistakes or that's the whole thing. A lawyer's only purpose is to find the mistakes in documents. And if we give them a, a tool and say, hey, this tool can do it like 95% right, they will immediately start to find all the errors in our system and say, ah, but we can do it better. So it's very hard audience to sell product like this. It's much better to work with uh, the legal department at, at large enterprises because they have a, a much higher pressure to be more efficient and they don't have time to do all of this and they don't want to do it and they don't uh, they don't uh, get paid by the hourly hourly payments or hourly uh, fees so what we are trying to do is to say that you have a lot of uh, standardized documents, as I said, Sekretessavtal, Personifisbetredsavtal, end user license agreements, very boring documents, consultancy agreements, or others, high volume, but not that complex uh, agreement types. Uh, and because five years ago, if you had more work in a legal department, you had to hire one more lawyer. That's the only way to don't do the work or hire one more. But we try to help them do, them to do more process more documents and yeah so you get you get a lot of agreements we review them in the tool and you get review documents and other end but it's also interesting that what we are trying to do is not only help the, the legal department to work more efficient but the best way to help them is actually if the end user are doing the review themselves so we are building a tool that makes the sales department or the procurement able to review standardized documents according to the company's requirements and fix them themselves before they even have to talk to the legal department. Then it's even more efficient, of course. And the, the business case for this is, of course, that if the end user or the 
procurement or sales department can review documents the say in 15 minutes and close a deal instead of waiting the average time to get an answer from a legal department in-house legal department is two weeks that's uh, in average of course but so if you have a you want to close your deal and you have a person if you split trailers at all you have to get reviewed first and you have to wait two weeks then you get that is not that fun for the sales department today so if we can help them do it in 15 minutes and you can take care of yourself it's much better does it work i will now demonstrate what we actually have done and we have clients i mean we are had launched this three years ago as a commercial product so we have clients today and i will showcase how, first how it works just in our standardized uh, demo environment and then i should showcase from one of the clients we have how they work with it uh, hopefully it works as always also what we have done is that we are a little bit different than other uh, companies we are doing this on specific document types a lot of other or lot some of these others i mentioned before kira luminance they are trying to work with all type of documents at the same time we have decided that we are, will do it on specific documents so we have all the training data uh, we have also we can do all the settings for the documents so let's see we can today we have some of these i will do a nda so if you would like to review an nda I'd have to sign in, of course. So you can submit, upload the document. First, you choose what perspective you have. Are you the in an NDA? Are you the one that are disclosing uh, confidential information, or you're receiving it? And then the document should look different, of course, for you. So let's upload it. It doesn't matter if it's a Word file or a PDF. So what we are doing now, we are taking away all the formatting and everything, and then comparing this document against best practice. How should a NDA look like if you are the disclosing party? What should be in it? If something is uh, missing or something is uh, wrong, <laughs> and then we display it. And it will take, I think this uh, document is like five pages, and for us it will take one and a half minutes, something around that. While we are waiting, I can also say we are doing this in English. So the, all the algorithm, everything is trained in English. We have, are using, and that's also because 90% of all legal documents in the business is in English, regardless of country. But we are also using translators. So if you have a Swedish or a Arabic <coughs> document, we are using a Deeple or Amazon Translate to translate it first. So we can also review them in 60 languages, but then it's just translation. But it works fine for our clients. It's a little bit slow, but it's moving. And we are using our own data set. We have law students in Ukraine doing data labeling. Uh, we don't want to use our customers' data because then it's confidentiality issues and uh, yeah, other things. And we are uh, so we are using our own data set uh, and building it on a lot of different NLP technologies. Uh, hopefully, it's a little bit long today, but it's faster than we did. I could just add, Magnus, even if it takes time, your stuff at least works, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now we have reviewed the document. And first of all, we just get the summary saying that this was a non-disclosure agreement. It's the file name. It was a unilateral. It was a mutual NDA purpose. Is verbal information included or covered in this? We have the contract period, governing law and jurisdiction, the most important parts of the document. We can see it's under Estonian law, and you have arbitration in Estonian Chamber of Commerce if something goes wrong. Uh, but then, and we have tried to do this very simple, so everyone should understand what we, what we have done or what the tool is doing. So first, we have what issues to be addressed. And this case is that parties. We just had one part. No, we don't have any parties in this. Yeah, exactly. 
So this is completely missing, no parties. Then there's no link to anything. And then we have an issue. We have, we have found out that, that in this agreement, the receiving party has the right to disclose the confirmation, the confidential information to its affiliates. It means like if you are dealing with one Volvo uh, company, they are allowed to share it with all the Volvo companies. And that's not best practice. You should try to keep it within one uh, company. And then they are missing liability and other things. But we also have found that we found the purpose. There were a purpose, there were term, term of the agreement was there, independent contractors, governing law and dispute other governing law and dispute, yeah, okay. So we can see here, oh, sorry, wrong side of the. So this is then picked up from the agreement as such. As we see, the agreement is governed by Estonian law. So yes, it was correct. And it was uh, under, uh, yeah, disputes are around, uh, under the, the arbitration in the Estonian Chamber of Commerce. So yes, this was correct. So this is how it works in general. We are just reviewing it against best practice. I will do this then, uh, showcase it how it works for a client instead. And I'm allowed to show this, so I will. So this oh, never do live demos. So one of our clients is Alpha Laval. And Alpha Laval uh, started to use us. It's their legal department found out that all the NDAs they get or the sales department have a lot of NDAs they have to review. And they don't want to do that or they don't have time and so on. So we have built a specific Alpha Laval tool that reviews the NDAs against Alpha Laval's requirements, how it should look for them. And then it's uh, uh, distributed to all the, in the sales organization globally. So it's not, in this case, it's not lawyers are using it. It's actually ordinary salespeople. <laughs> of course, they're used to, uh, to documents or, or uh, agreements, but it's, uh, and then we have done it a little bit different. We use the same document, so it will be the result will be a little bit different in this case. Uh, and it takes this one and a half minutes. It doesn't for us. It, it's if the the agreement is two pages or 50 pages it will still take one and a half minutes and uh, it's uh, even uh, regardless of language it doesn't matter it will take this it's always one and a half minute or around that uh, but to solve this that you don't want to sit here and just stare at this for one and a half minutes you can always email to the system and get an email back when it's the review is ready so if you don't want to look at the screen <laughs> Hopefully it's, yeah. I think it, this is a, a better example showing out exactly what we can do. So that's why I would, I could have, next time I will open it directly, but you can wait for a minute. <laughs> I have a document that I'm allowed to show because it's not showing any secrets, but as maybe know, you maybe know is for all companies, it's a little bit secret what they are reviewing and how they're doing the review. They have all sorts of things they don't want us to see, but here it's quite, this is okay. So, so now we have done it a little bit different. Just because of the, the audience is not non-lawyers, we have taken away some of the review. They are not interested in everything. They are interested in the most more, what to say, they have some no-goes <laughs> and uh, they are not interested to see everything. And we have actually taken away, for instance, everything that is uh, uh, compliant because who cares? <laughs> they just want to see what is not compliant. Uh, 
But then we have done it a little bit different. And I think this is also good in the sense that it showcases the limitations of AI. Because the first thing we have uh, addressed here is that you have your, you, yourself have to check if the purpose of the NDA are specific enough. You always have a purpose. Why are we doing this agreement? Because of this business case, we should, I would like to buy your companies and so on. But we can't, an AI, as far as I know, an AI can't say that this is specific enough. It's too complicated. So we will just say you have to check it yourself. But this is a list at least. And then we have term and termination. And before, in, when I did this with our general review, it says that, okay, it's green flag because you have a term and termination in the agreement. But now it's red flag because Alpha Laval wants agreements to be no, not any longer than five years. And then it says here that we would like it to be five years. And then I open it and see that it says it will be valid indefinitely. And OK, that's not OK then. You should change that to five years. So this is how we try to help them. And you can do this as a non-lawyer. You can read the document, get the instructions, and actually reply to your counterpart saying, we will not accept this. You have to change to five years. They have others like return of the documents. They always have, want to keep a copy because of because they are uh, on the stock exchange. They always have to keep things like that. So they need to keep a copy. And then they have to check the, in the NDA that it, are they allowed to keep a, a copy after the project or something? Yes. In this case, they are not. I think it says that it says nothing around that. I don't have to. Uh, uh, they have to return or destroy everything. And that is not OK, according to Alpha Lavalle. Yes, so today we have this as a product. And we have uh, customers. I will just uh, yeah, see if I had anything else. So we are working with Alpha Laval, Dustin, Landman, and, and others. Uh, quite a lot more companies and also actually law firms uh, that are, uh, we have a white label our solution so they can offer this to their clients. We have Thomasen that's the, maybe the best Norwegian law firm like Mannheim Svartling, but in Norway that we launched last week uh, officially that they are our clients. Uh, yes. I spoke very fast. I... <laughs> but maybe I can just ask yeah. one question because I am the moderator. I can I can do what you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, can you sort of uh, say something about the technologies that you use for extracting? What type of models and have you trained them yourself? Have you yes. fine-tuned? Uh, we are still small enough so we can change technology. <laughs> so we for actually one of these data points we're using GTP free. We have started with that. We had it for more, but then we take, took it away because the result was not good enough. And uh, because of the cost and the time it takes to get the reply from it be free. But we are using uh, transformers in different ways. Yeah. And we have developed this very, we have a lot of different technologies depending on the purpose of the, what we are doing, what we try to find. Uh, we have our own data set, as I said. Uh, everything is our own. And, and we are not using any of the customer's data. Uh, and if you would like to know more specifically what we have technologies, I have to uh, also include my CTO in that, because otherwise I will say something, he will be, get angry a little bit later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. So thank you so much for the.